So now let's take the seven equivalent circuit concept and let's apply this to different fault types. And the first thing we'll do is we'll take a look at a single phase fault. And in this case, we're assuming that we're applying this fault at a bus K. And so what we're gonna be doing is from the diagonal of the Z bus, we're through inspection, how are we gonna get these values? Um, what we're gonna have is we're gonna have the, the the three by three impedance values. And um, what we're gonna have is we'll have Z7 and AA, BB, CC, and then A, B, A, C, and B, C. So that the, these values give us the coupling between the phases. Um, so again, you can get this a number of different ways through inspection, or if you have the bus impedance matrix, you can, you can pull it out of there as well. So, for our fault, let's go ahead and just assume we're going to put the fault on phase A, and this fault can have a certain resistance associated with it. Uh, this is sometimes useful if you want to model high impedance faults. A lot of utilities will maybe look at a range of fault impedances between 0 and 40 ohms, uh, where 40 ohms might be, say, the, the case where you do have a tree limb fall into the line. It's not drawing a lot of current, but you want to try to quantify that somehow. So to get the value of current, all we need to do, if you just look at the circuit, is we just take the voltage and divide through by the, the seven impedance AA um, plus RF, the fault impedance. And that's gonna give us the current that's gonna be flowing through this fault. Sorry. Um, so anyway, this is pretty basic calculation. Now, one thing we could do once we have this fault current is we can also see what's going to be the impact of that fault current at the voltages at other buses in the circuit. Because what we're going to see a lot of times is, is the fault current so large that it maybe causes a voltage sag at other bus points. So given that this bus impedance injection now um, can be determined for this, for this uh, system, what we're going to have at this point of the fault is if the fault current is actually flowing out from a bus impedance matrix uh, standpoint, this is actually minus IF, and we just have this in phase A. What I can do is if I want to calculate what the um, new voltage is going to be at some other bus where I don't have the fault, let's say this is going to be a bus J, I can add to the pre-fault value of that voltage the change in voltage due to that fault current. And the change in voltage due to that fault current is going to be given by ZJK times I fault. So in this particular case, if I've got a um, three-phase bus, and this is three by one, then this ZJK, this could maybe be three by three, or this could be two by three or one by three, depending on the, what the nature of bus J is. But what I can do is if I have this off diagonal term from the bus impedance matrix, I can multiply this by the fault uh, matrix, and I can use that to give me the change in voltage. And we'll see this later in the in the examples too, we'll see some numbers associated with this as well. Um, as far as getting this value again, as I mentioned before, what this value ZJK is, it's the impedance that's common to both these buses. So let's suppose that this fault is at bus K. All right, this is the location of the fault. Well, how's that going to impact the voltage at bus J? Well, it's going to impact the voltage due to the change in voltage, which is going to occur across these two sections. And you can see in this case, this is Z12 plus Z23. And so if you had this particular circuit right here, one way you can get this value ZJK is just, just through inspection. If you look at the faulted bus K and you look at the non-faulted bus J, you're trying to get the change in voltage at, what are the sections of the circuit that are common to both? And just simply sum those up. And what that's going to do, that's going to give you Z, J, K. Now, that is for a grounded system. 
what would happen if the source were ungrounded? Let's suppose we just didn't have any tie to ground. Well, if you were gonna go ahead and put a fault here with respect to ground, if I had no ground reference associated with these voltages, this current just simply equals to zero. And so we would actually see something like this in real life. If we had say like a source transformer that was an ungrounded Y circuit, um, that would give us no tie to ground in this case, right? And we wouldn't see any current associated with this. And so this actually can happen. One thing I should point out here is there's usually some stray capacitance out there. Usually what you're gonna have in a real circuit is there's going to be stray capacitance the ground if you have cables um, even if you have overhead there's a little bit of stray capacitance anywhere you have metal with respect to ground you're going to get stray capacitance and so in a real circuit you wouldn't exactly get zero you'd get a smaller current but it wouldn't be the large current you would normally associated with um, ground circuits if we would apply a two-phase fault to this scenario, then basically we could look at adding having a fault resistance RF and we just kind of close the switch. Basically, you could see what we're creating with respect to the seven equivalent circuit is we're just creating a loop, right? And so we have a source voltage at the begin on the left side of this loop, which is a seven in voltage for phase A minus a seven in voltage for phase B. And then this is going to be equal to the drop we have across here, across phase A due to the phase A current, um, plus an additional drop due to the current flowing in phase B. And since this fault current is now flowing in the opposite direction in phase B, then this is going to give us a voltage drop, which is the Thevenin and AB value, the mutual value, times minus IF. Um, then the current loops around, so we're going to get an additional drop across 7 and value BB times IF. And then because of the fact that we have mutual coupling between the phases, um, then what we're also going to get is we're going to get an additional drop in phase B due to the current flowing through phase A. Uh, and then one other voltage drop we're going to have in here is we have a fault resistance, the voltage drop across the fault resistance. And so if we use this to solve for the current, then the fault current is going to be the difference in voltages um, divided by the sum of these two um, self impedances minus two times the mutual impedance plus R sub F. And so um, this is what we're going to use to get the value for the current. One thing I should point out here at for this particular scenario, since this fault's not grounded, since it's line to line, that this voltage at A does not go to zero. It's, it's actually going to have some non-zero value associated with it. Now, if we are going to put this, take the results we get for the individual fault current, and we plug them into a three by one matrix to represent the kind of like the I bus, the injected current, um, then the current that we're going to have flowing through phase A looks like minus IF. The current we have for phase B is look like IF. Again, this is kind of like a current injection. And again, if I have a bus J, if I want to get the post fault value, I can take the pre fault value and add to that ZJK times this um, three by one fault matrix. And so again, I can get this by inspection. And then the, what this is going to enable me to do is get the change in voltages at the non-fault buses. If I have a grounded line-to-line -line fault, this is quite a bit more complex. So you'll see in different texts, they'll put this resistance in different locations. I'm going to put this between the buses and ground. So basically, I'm going to assume that the, uh, the voltage at A and B are going to be the same. Um, and then you're going to have a, a fault current that's going to flow through this resistance RF. Um, but what we're going to have in this situation is you're going to have these two voltages that have to be the same. So VKA is equal to VKB. And then what you're going to have for VKA is the Thevenin voltage at A 
minus the drop across the A phase. And again, you're going to have mutual coupling effect right here. And then you're going to have the, the voltage at B is the seven voltage for, for B phase minus the drop across the B phase. All right. So this gives you a couple other equations. And then one other equation you're going to get is the fact that VKA is going to be RF times whatever this fault current is. All right. Where this net fault current, the net fault current that's going to flow through this resistance is going to be IFA plus IFB. And so that gives you another equation. So what you end up with is you end up with four equations and you end up with four unknowns. And what you have to do is you have to go through quite a bit of algebra to work this out. Um, so we're not going to really do much with this particular case in this class um, because it, you know, it, it takes quite a bit more work in order to, to do this particular sort of a fault type right here. But once you have this done, then basically if you're going to take these um, two fault currents that you calculate, uh, you could actually use this to figure out what the change in voltage is going to be at the other buses as well. So for a granted three phase fault, this is a scenario where all the buses are tied together, but what we're going to have is we're going to have a common resistance to earth ground. And sometimes people would look at the case for R equals zero, or sometimes they might put a little bit of resistance in there. In this situation, this is going to be a little bit different than looking at a conventional fault using symmetrical component analysis because these, diag these diagonal terms here for the seven impedance for phases A, B, and C, they may not be all the same anymore. And also these off diagonal terms may not be the same anymore. And so you're gonna get a different result than you would get if you were gonna to try to use symmetrical components. In this case, you have all these voltages that are the same, these are all tied together. And then what you're gonna have for each of these faulted phase voltages is say like for phase A, you're gonna have the Thevenin voltage for phase A minus the dropper cost phase A minus the drop due to the mutual coupling with phase B minus the drop due to the mutual coupling with, with phase C. Uh, and you're gonna have similar equations for, for phases B and for C. And then one other relationship you have is this voltage at bus A for phase A is gonna be RF times the sum total of these currents right here. So anyway, you've got a number of different equations and unknowns that you need to solve for. Um, but this is going to take some matrix calculations as well. Um, and I'll show you like later on with an example what, what this would actually look like. But anyway, once this is done, then for the fault current, then if you want to calculate the change in voltage at other buses, then your, your current bus injection is going to be minus these three different fault currents. Before I go to the example, I just want to make a comment on the difference between phase components and symmetrical components. It turns out the circuits are transposed, they give you exactly the same results. And so we've seen before that the zero sequence impedance is ZS plus two ZM, the positive sequence value is ZS minus ZM, and the negative sequence value is ZS minus ZM, assuming everything's three phase and transposed. If everything's three phase and transposed, this is what we would have. From a class, if you've had this before, power system analysis where you went into symmetrical components, what you've seen is when you calculate the fault current, basically this is gonna be three times the seven in voltage divided by the sum of the, the three impedances, Z, zero, Z1 plus Z2, plus three times the fault resistance. And so, What's sort of interesting is that if you substitute in for Z0, Z1, and Z2, assuming transposition, you, you substitute into this formula, what you see is that IF is Z Thevenin minus, sorry, Z Thevenin divided by ZS plus RF, which is exactly 
the, the result we had earlier when we just looked at a, a single line to ground fault. And so um, anyway, they, they do kind of match up. Both approaches will match up. Assuming everything is all three phase and assuming you have transposition, uh, we would get the same results either way. But again, what you have to watch out for is a real circuit for a distribution circuit. You can't count on these impedances all being the same for the diagonal terms or the impedances all being the same for the off diagonal terms. Okay, so um, let me go in the next video segment. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some different work examples so you can kind of see, you know, just what this all looks like when we start putting numbers in here.